Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Teens for Business. I'm your host, Jackie, and today I'm so excited to announce that this is a very special episode where I'll be talking to Professor Rye, who is a professor of management at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. So, Professor Rye, thank you so much for being here today. Could you just give us a really quick introduction to yourself? Sure. Yeah, Jackie, it's a pleasure to be on. Thanks for having me. So, like you said, I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at the Wharton School. The research that I do focuses on innovation, particularly uh, in what's called hybrid ventures. So I'm really interested in how business and entrepreneurship can be used for tools for good in the world. And then as a part of that, I'm also the co-director of the Wharton Impact Investing Research Lab. So we're doing a lot of research about how to leverage uh, private capital and you know, private equity, venture capital, and get that to entrepreneurs who are trying to change the world with their businesses. Yeah, that's very interesting. So. Um... To talk a little bit about your journey in business and entrepreneurship, what was your entrepreneurship journey like? Were you someone who always had like many business ideas going on or was it something that had to like develop into place? It's a great question. I had always been interested in doing something entrepreneurial uh, going way back into my childhood. And so my journey, it was a little bit interesting because I really changed the way that I thought about business and what my ambitions were in entrepreneurship as I went through the journey. So when I was younger, it was all about just making money. And I really, really wanted to do something that would be massively successful. Uh, and I really just wanted to be rich, which is a completely vacuous goal. But at the time, I mean, it was really motivating for me. And so started a few things, I mean, like lemonade kind of and stuff when I was really young. And then as I got to I me, mean, probably about your age, got more serious about actually trying to launch some stuff. And so, you know, put together a few things really early on in the kind of the initial age of e-commerce. Uh, and I was living in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada at the time and hadn't quite put together that there was no VC money there. You know, that Canada was this, you know, really sort of like, you know, walled off market, uh, you know, especially for the kind of stuff that we were trying to do. And, you know, what I was reading about in like Wired magazine, uh, you know, Silicon Valley at the time did, did not apply <laughs> to my circumstance. Uh, and so it never really went anywhere. And to the course of doing this, I had uh, a couple of bad co-founder experiences. And so, you know, the co-founders that I had worked with, we were aligned in terms of wanting to do something really financially lucrative. But you know, they pushed it to a level that I thought was just really, really counterproductive. They were, they ended up being the kind of people, and uh, if you haven't come across them yet, you will in your life, but they would, you know, like step on your neck if they thought it would get them ahead. And it just really left me with a bad taste in my mouth. And they'd also say things like, you know, it's not personal, it's just business, which struck me as totally disingenuous because of course it's personal to the other person, right? It may not be personal to you, but to the other person, it's deeply personal. And so I got much more interested in that point of thinking about, okay, well, how do we use venture as a tool for good? Uh, and, and that steered me down the road towards hybrid enterprise, uh, impact entrepreneurship, social enterprise. Yeah, um, I think it's always like really interesting to hear about how someone as experienced and as successful as you and like how that journey kind of came to be. Um, and so for all of the high school students listening to this, um, how would you suggest a student or someone who's relatively new to the business world start their um, hybrid venture, right? So like starting any kind of company is difficult for anyone of any age, but specifically for someone who has uh, less experience. Yeah. So first off, I don't think that I would encourage anyone to limit themselves to hybrid ventures. So hybrid is, is, is one organizing model. But what I'd encourage people, you know, of any age to do, including your age, is to really think about issues in the world that you'd like to address. And, you know, it, it can be that those issues support really, really, you know, financially lucrative businesses. And in those cases, it's actually really nice because you can, you know, crowd in capital to address issues at scale, uh, you know, do good at the same time that the venture is, you know, really financially healthy and the entrepreneur gets rewarded, uh, you know, financially for their efforts. Um, you know, in other cases, you will need to have some of these trade-offs where, you know, every business is going to create value and then different businesses can capture different portions of that value, right? And so, you know, for some problems, you'll be able to create a lot of value, but not capture as much. And that's where hybrid organizing kind of comes in 
And you have to think about, you know, how you prioritize, you know, financial mission versus impact goals. But that's all stuff that's secondary to zeroing in on a problem and starting to think about a novel solution. So, you know, simple things like keeping a diary of ideas, you know, problems, pain points, um, you know, that's, that's the first step in the process. And then the other thing is don't be intimidated by, you know, entrepreneurship and think that, you know, you have to go from idea to, you know, billion dollar business like you'd read about in, you know, in TechCrunch or something. I mean, it's a lot less intimidating to actually start something than it seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that's a really good point of just like having like a starting from somewhere really simple and just thinking about what changes I would like to see in the world and starting from there. Um, I think that's a really good point, especially for a lot of high schoolers, because there's um, a lot of things in the world that could probably be better. And so just having that list of, OK, this thing, this thing, and then starting off simple, I guess. Um, and then would you say that starting a hybrid social venture could be a little bit more difficult for teenagers or people with less experience? Because there is that aspect of you have a social mission you want to change in the world, but also you like want to profit as well so would that be a little bit more difficult than a sole like nonprofit or like a for-profit company yeah it certainly can be um you know you have to find a model where the two pieces fit together relatively seamlessly uh if they're constantly in tension it's going to be hard to get anywhere and if there are real trade-offs you can't convey a clear identity it's going to be hard to you know raise money and really clearly position in the market so th those things all create challenges um, you know, you asked if it's tougher for teenagers. I don't think so. Um, you know, with any kind of venture, what it comes down to is expertise in the space, right? So if there's a, a problem in the world and, you know, if it was easy to address profitably, someone would have done it already, right? So the key is to really get to that level of nuance where you see a solution that other people haven't seen. And that's just a matter of really taking a deep dive into the space, right? So we have some research that shows that the most successful entrepreneurs tend to be about 45 years old when they start a venture, right? But that just has to do with the fact that they have been in that industry where they launched something for a long time, they have some resources, and uh, you know they have some network connections, right? You can build all that stuff early on. You just got to you know incrementally get into that area where you want to build something that. Right. So, you know, young people, you're attuned to a whole different set of issues than than other people are. And you have unique perspectives on these things, how they exist at pain points, but also some insights about how they could be addressed and just, you know, becoming experts in that space, going deeper and deeper. That's when the opportunity starts to pop out. So when I was, you know, your age, you know, I don't know if these things are still around or not, but Magic Eye was a thing. So do, do you know what I'm talking about? No. It was the there were these pictures and they'd publish them in the newspapers, which again tells you how old I am, right? Like newspapers. Um, and it would look like just chaos, like a, almost like a Jackson Pollock kind of painting. And you'd kind of, you know, move closer and further out and eventually like a picture would pop out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? That's entrepreneurship. You just got to stare at a space long enough. And I don't mean stare passively, like, but like be engaged in a space long enough that the solution starts to pop out. Right. And teenagers can do that as well as anyone who's older. Right. Oh, now that you explain it, I always see them like sometimes on social media of like, oh, look, like close your left eye and stare through your charging port. Like, what do you see? Like <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would be the, uh, you know, the contemporary teched up version of uh, what they used to publish by the Ziggy comic when I was growing up. Yeah, I mean, I guess that kind of just goes to show like there's there's a lot of space for innovation. There's a lot of things that people can do. Um, I'm sure like even before that, like whoever, if you told someone 200 years ago that on a piece of paper, you could just print stuff out and look at it from the side and stare at it at a certain way, you can see things. I'm sure that would be very surprising to them. Totally, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, and so going back to hybrid business ventures. So um, as you mentioned, like there is that point where you have to like balance your, like how much do you want to impact the world and like how big do you want that to be versus like your profitability. And so- there has to be a point, I think, where you have to like choose or like prioritize a little bit. Um, first of all, like, would you agree with that? And second of all, um, if so, like, how does one even choose? Like, obviously, both are important. So, like, how does that? How does that come into play? Yeah, so I wouldn't frame it in terms that are quite that stark. I, I think you're right. 
you know, you, you need to be very clear about what your priorities are, but it's not a binary, right? You have to think about really what it comes down to is, you know, if you had to make a decision, what would that decision be, right? When things are really, really hard, what decision would you make? Which side would you come down on, right? Because it's really easy to have, you know, morals, ethics, values, or, you know, like a social impact goal with your venture when things are easy, right? It, it's only when things get hard and you have to actually make uncomfortable decisions that you know what's important. So being very clear about that stuff early on, <clears throat> if you're going to do something in social enterprise is important. Because, you know, if it's going to come down on the financial side consistently, you know, maybe, you know, the impact piece isn't the right one for you. Um, that said, these are tricky issues because if you're running a social enterprise and you can't make enough money to sustain the organization, you will have zero impact, right? So, you know, thinking about how these things fit together is really tough and you might have to make some trade-offs. The other thing is, you know, the longer you spend thinking about how the pieces fit together, the more sophisticated your thinking is going to get. And so, you know, you're going to move away from simple trade-off reasoning. Okay, I need to do more of this uh, in exchange for less of that. And you're going to start to be able to see like synthetic intersections, like creative points where you can pull them together in ways uh, that wouldn't be obvious to other people. Or maybe, you know, like the role of time comes in or you know other variables maybe the social context needs to change and then the pieces fit together right um but that only comes from really being invested in thinking about you know how the pieces are going to fit together yes yeah, so i think i guess that goes back to your point about how like experience in the field can be really really valuable um like if you spend a lot of time thinking and like you start to realize things that people haven't seen before in the field that just gives you an advantage because then you're able to choose or just how to better be able to intersect them together. Yeah, I mean, you know, knowledge is an amazing thing. You know, the more you know, the more fine-grained insights you're going to have, things that other people don't see are going to be really obvious to you, right? Like, uh, you know, I teach exec ed classes on digital transformation and opportunity recognition, and I always like to show them a picture of an alligator and a crocodile and ask them what they've seen, and, you know, they invariably say two versions of the same thing, but like if a veterinarian looked at those two pictures, they tell you right away. I mean, these animals live in different parts of the world. They have different diets, you know, like on and on. It's because knowledge lets you see things that other people can't see, right? <laughs> so, so building out that knowledge base is so central to, to doing anything in, anything in entrepreneurship that'll be successful, whether it's a financial venture, uh, a nonprofit, or some sort of a hybrid. Right, right. Um, and so I think also for a lot of like teenagers or high schoolers um they haven't really had a lot of experience but if they were interested in having like they're really passionate about a social issue but at the same time wanted to have like that profitability because like as you said um if you don't have that aspect of financials it's kind of hard to actually make a change if you can't keep your company running um but when you're thinking about like which one or like trade-offs but also thinking about like because i think at some point you do have to say like not so much prioritizing it, but you do have to be like, okay, we're going to do this, that, things like that. So um, would you say it's better or like as a whole, um, obviously there's like nuances to this, but would you say it's better to like have everything like planned out at the beginning and you can of course change as you go on, but, or would you say just like go ahead, start, and then as things come up, try it out? Okay. So, I mean, two things I'd say to that, and it's a really good question. Uh, one is there's a, a wonderful quote by Mike Tyson, which is something along the lines of everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face, right? <laughs> and that's entrepreneurship too. You can have the best plan, you can have everything figured out, but as soon as you're out doing this, you're going to get smacked in the face and you're going to be scrambling. So, you know, over preparing gives you a false sense of confidence. So, you know, there's there's declining returns to that, like building a solid base of expertise. And I realize I'm hitting this, this point a lot, but it's for a good reason. Uh, that's really good. Uh, but building the perfect sandcastle uh, isn't a good idea because, you know, something's going to come in and it's not going to work and you're going to overinvest it in something that's not a good use of your time. Um, oh, now I forgot the second thing I was going to say, but I'm sure it was going to be wonderfully insightful. <laughs> of course it was. Um, and you we talk a lot about like building experience, right? Um, so do I like take it as 
there are going to be times where it's trial and error like you inevitably have to be like oh okay well that kind of didn't really work as much as I thought it would or um that just was not a good idea um does that like where the experience come in like inevitably at the beginning oh 100 percent. so there's two ways you learn one is you know by by reading about stuff you know archival desk research the other is by doing right and if you can't fail when you're doing you're not going to learn anything right so this is the whole silicon valley mantra of fail fast fail cheap fail off and fail forward right because you know things aren't going to work and what you want to do is you want to set up conditions where you can fail in low stakes way where you build your learning build your expertise and by the time it actually matters you've got a pretty good idea about what's going to work and what isn't so i mean the number one thing for any aspiring entrepreneur is not to be afraid of failure it's just to try and set it up so you're failing in small and private ways as exposed to you know public and expensive ways um and there's a whole bunch of like very pragmatic steps you can take in order to do that. And I remember the other thing I was going to say uh, in response to your previous question, which was when you're thinking about doing something, you know, social enterprise or, you know, in business more generally, um, you know, don't presuppose what kind of model you're going to need to do that. So, you know, what you should do is start with the problem you want to solve, figure out what the solution would be, and then if you've landed on a solution that looks good and effective, figure out if that's something that's going to support, you know, just a pure profit play venture. And there are a lot of ventures that have lots of social value that they create and they're very, very profitable, right? So that's one end of the continuum. Still creates a lot of social or environmental value. It might be that it's more of a hybrid where you're going to have some tensions in the middle, but there's a business model where you can actually sustain the organization on earned income. The other possibility is that not every solution is a business solution. And that doesn't mean the solution is not worth pursuing. You just want to think about entrepreneurship in terms of building an organization, not a business. So you could build a nonprofit or a charity, and it just changes the way you think about getting the money in. So instead of trying to generate revenue, you get uh, grants, you get subsidies, you get donations, right? Maybe you have some earned income, uh, but you just look at different ways of financing the operations, right? So start with the problem, work up to a solution, and then think about you know what the proper model is that that this is going to work within. Right. So like you don't, or I guess you shouldn't really start with I want to make a hybrid social venture, but rather start with the problem and then go, okay, I think a hybrid social venture would work best, or um, a nonprofit would work best to fit my problem and solution. Yeah, I mean, and the, the one sort of caveat on this is, you know, it's good to, you know, have these all as options in, in the back of your mind, right? So when you're looking for solutions, you could look for solutions that would fit the model of a hybrid social venture. Mm -hmm. So let's say, you know, you care about a problem of like, so venture capital, there, there's not enough uh, women and minorities who are in venture capital, right? Okay, so how do you solve this? You know, one could be a charity, right? So we're going to raise money and we're going to build awareness programs. We're going to teach you know, venture capital skills in schools, and then, you know, help counselors to do career planning with these, you know, underrepresented populations to get them into venture. You know, and on the other side, you could say, well, I'm going to start my, start a fund, which is going to be helmed by, you know, women and minorities. And that's going to be our investment thesis. This is going to be, you know, who our investment committee is, uh, you know, and so, and a hybrid could be somewhere in the middle, right? So let's start an, an impact investment fund, uh, you know, that does all of these things. Right. So you can think about these different options as a way to sort of get a sense about where you could build out. But, you know, you don't want to just zero in on one thing. Right. Because it's it's really going to be the best solution and certainly not going to be the most creative one. That's true. That's very true. So just not limiting yourself, I guess, to um, a singular choice. Um, and to go back to something you said before about um, failing in like a lower stakes way or just failing in a more um, less expensive way, I guess. Um, how, like, what would an example of that be? Like, how do you set it up in the sense that you're not failing publicly, like you said? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing you do is you learn as much as you can uh, before you start doing anything. And so, I mean, part of that's like the, you know, the reading and the desk research and all of that stuff. But the other thing is, you know, once you zero in on a problem you want to address, talk to the people that it affects, right? And really understand the world through their eyes. How do they perceive the problem? What solutions are they trying? 
what are they like? What are they not? Are they, you know, are they paying money to try and solve this? Uh, yes, no, uh, whatever. You know, would you pay money to solve this? You know, all of these things, right? So that's going to give you some insight into like what the space is where you're working, and it's going to help you come up with a better solution because it's going to be rooted in you know the lived experiences of the people who are experiencing this pain point. So that's one thing. And then the other one is, as you're starting to develop ideas for solutions, just test them in really sort of, you know, quick and easy ways, right? Like do interviews with people. Hey, you know, like I'm thinking about this idea, this problem affects you, uh, you know, maybe you'd be interested in the product or service that I'm thinking about, you know, what do you think of this idea, right? And so, you know, if they tell you it's a bad idea, that's probably pretty honest because interactions are set up with a social desirability bias. If they tell you the idea is good, that's great. I mean, that's encouragement, keep going. And then you can do, you know, like small tests where you like see what it might cost you to acquire a customer or you, you know, build a, it's called the minimum viable product. So you actually, you know, build a smaller version of, of something and you put it in people's hands, see how they interact with it. So, you know, all of these just like, small little tests that are all designed to get like little bits of micro learning mm, yeah so i that as opposed to like starting with the product all developed and then going in so testing it from like step, steps up basically. yeah the last thing you want to do is like sit at your desk in your office and write a business plan that is like 20 year old thinking uh you know little bits it's all about hypotheses right I think this is going to happen. What is the cheapest, quickest way that I could test this and figure out if I'm right or not? And you want to be super precise in how you define those hypotheses, crafty and cheap with how you test them, and then you learn from the results. Well, I, I guess that's insight. You said 20-year-olds just want the whole business plan down, but now you're telling us instead to go step by step, and if it fails, go back and think about it again. Oh, yeah. And I'm, so what I meant to say was the thinking about writing a business plan is from 20 years ago. Oh, not, not like year olds want to build the whole thing. Oh. Um, yeah, I probably misspoke. Oh my gosh. Well, tw 20 years ago. So like, has that all changed? Like, is it different? Now understand that it's better to test like step by step. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Is yeah. that, I'm just curious here, but is that like through like the culture of like people realizing it doesn't work or is that because of like a research shift or is that like both? I mean, you know, the research is actually just catching up on this. It was uh, really an innovation that came out of practice. And actually, I shouldn't say it didn't come out of research. So if you look at kind of the historical origins of what we call lean entrepreneurship today, it uh, started right around 2000 with actually two researchers who were at UPenn, uh, one of whom was a good friend of mine, uh, retired a few years ago named Ian McMillan, uh, is wonderfully a Serbic South African guy. Uh, and then uh, another woman named uh, Rita McGrath, who uh, went on to Columbia and is now like, you know, a guru person doing, uh, you know, really interesting work. Um, you know, and their insight was, you know, you want to, you know, you want to plan, but then you want to test and, you know, discover as you go. Uh, that same set of ideas got picked up and repackaged by Eric Reese in 2011. He wrote this book called The Lean Startup. Uh, and that really was sort of the sea change in how people, especially in tech, thought about developing ventures, right? So especially if you're doing something where code is a big part of it, um, you can test little bits really easily, right? And if you're wrong, you can change the code. So it's it's pretty easy to implement this approach, but it's since like expanded into every industry, right? So even if you're gonna do something that's like consumer product goods, you know, there's still lots of, you know, really small scale iteration. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's actually very interesting. Like learning about how um two researchers and like professors at, at Penn um started that, and it was like a book. So I guess like it was both kind of like research and like the practice of it coming together. Yeah, and you know the stuff that uh, that Ian and uh, Rita were doing back in the day. I mean, it wasn't like you know the kind of research that I would do, right? Where you go out and you you know develop hypotheses, you get a data set, you test it, you write it up. I mean, they were doing more like sort of thought leadership speculation, you know. Uh, so they, there was not a ton of evidence that it was actually working. It was just sort of like, you know, this is a, an approach that makes more sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, lots of anecdotal evidence. Um, and then it got really popular when Eric Ries wrote The Lean Startup. And then Osterwalder and Pigner wrote their book, uh, you know, Business Model. Uh, is it called Business Model Canvas? Anyway, that was the tool they developed. 
And then Steve Blank, uh, who is a, a successful entrepreneur and then adjunct lecturer at Stanford, started writing stuff about like customer discovery, which is all about like interviewing your customers. And then he wrote this book, uh, you know, five, five Steps to the Epiphany, I think uh, was the title. And so all of this sort of like formed the corpus of, you know, like this, uh, you know, sort of perspective shift in how we approach entrepreneurship. And then it's since been validated by, you know, a lot of studies, uh, you know, a few of which uh, friends of mine have done, you know, showing that this stuff on balance does seem to work. Yeah, well, well, I just got a lot of book recommendations from that. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, and I think like the last thing I want to talk about is would you have any additional advice besides like getting experience and just taking like smaller steps um, like we talked about for entrepreneurs looking to start I guess not even like a hybrid social venture, but just starting anywhere right now. Um, are there any like specific skills um, that are like just things in general to keep in mind that would really help them in the process? Yeah, really good question. So one thing I would say is don't be daunted by the idea of starting something. It's not a binary the way that you think about it. Like, you know, yesterday I wasn't doing entrepreneurship and today I'm doing entrepreneurship, right? It, it, it's not like that. And you have to, you know, make this scary step. Um, you know, think about it as a journey, right? So you're an entrepreneur as soon as you adopt the mindset of looking for problems that are amenable to some sort of an innovative entrepreneurial solution, right? And so once you start going down that road, just commit yourself to taking the next steps when they present themselves. And this doesn't mean that you force yourself, you know, to work on ideas that aren't, you know, going to go anywhere. But you want to be mindful about, you know, okay, I see this opportunity. I think this is an interesting solution. How could I figure out if this is going to be, you know, something that's worth pursuing? And then just deepen your knowledge, right? Like just step by step. And the next steps are going to reveal themselves as you go. And then you're going to look backward and it's going to be like, oh my goodness, I'm like starting something. Uh, and it won't feel like this, you know, big sort of, you know, scary step where, okay, you're doing entrepreneurship now. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, this was advice that I got from an uncle of mine when I was about your age, and it stuck with me. Um, and I was really nervous about launching something. And I'd been sort of roommated on this idea for a while. I kind of liked it. I mean, in hindsight, it was completely half-baked. Um, but I was, you know, sort of, do I do it? Do I not? Uh, and I talked to an uncle of mine who's an entrepreneur, and he, he asked me, he's like, okay, so you know, what would happen if you did this and the worst thing happened? And I was like, well, I don't know. He's like, well, would you starve? It's like, no. Well, you know, <laughs> would you lose all your money and not have a place to live? No. He's like, well, then why wouldn't you just do it? <laughs> and it was this really helpful, you know, sort of frame around it, which was, you know, the stakes feel really big, but especially when you're your age, you know, if you have a supportive family, it's like, yeah, you know, if you fail, you're just going to learn a lot. And you know what, you're probably not going to end up homeless and hungry so you know, like do it yeah so a very big like I think mindset thing of realizing um just like you're getting experience out of it even if you fail you hopefully probably won't be like the end of your um somewhat career like it's it's okay to just like take that first step oh yeah and you will almost definitely fail right like it's just how it goes like entrepreneurship is a skill it's not like you step out onto the, you know, the ice and you're a figure skater in the Olympics or something, right? <laughs> like you will fall. This is what happens as you build that muscle, as you get good at it. Uh, but you just start, right? You know, and the worst case scenario was not like some existential thing. It's like, yeah, it kind of sucks. You learn, you pick yourselves up and you keep going. Yeah, I think that's actually like a really interesting point that you mentioned. Um, I know like some of my friends who are interested in like business, they kind of talk about like starting this really successful company, um, which is like a great, I guess, dream to have too. But like, I think when we're teenagers, as you said, like the first ones that we make are probably going to fail. Um, and so I think that's like a very interesting like shift to learn. I think like, obviously it's great to like try your best, but still like if you fail, that's statistically more probable than um, being super successful. No one plans to fail, right? And if you didn't think your idea was going to succeed, you wouldn't work on it. But, you know, there's a ton of things that are beyond your control. Uh, you know, and some of that is just, you, you don't know what you're doing, uh, you know, with the opportunity yet. And so, yeah, most things fail, but you learn, you keep going. Yeah, that's where like the experience comes in. And then when you're 45, research um, says that that's where most successful entrepreneurs are. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, but entrepreneurs are, you know, all ages. I mean, it really comes down to, you know, it's not the age. Age is nothing but a correlate, right? Like it's the mechanisms. So, you know, it's experience, it's contacts. Uh, and it's it's also, you know, looking at opportunities with a very sort of like logical lens, because if you're 45 and have a mortgage, you're not going to just charge after anything, right? You're going to need to see that the, you know, success prospects are there. Yeah, so I think like, experience and just learning having more experiences that's all a very like important thing to this yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 try a lot of stuff learn a lot of stuff and when you find something that resonates like go deep yeah um I think that part is a really good advice and really good quote um so when I write my blog on that I will definitely put that one in <laughs> um but yes yeah, awesome. so- Thank you so much, Professor Rai, for um, coming and speaking with me today. And I hope you guys all enjoyed this episode. And I'm looking forward to our next one.